does that look like graphically? Let's look at a concept called the vertical line test. Well, here's an example of, uh, of a function x equals 2y squared plus 1, which might look, this is going to be a horrible drawing, but it might look uh, something like this. Okay? Well, it wasn't too bad, but you get the idea it's a sideways parabola. Well, let's look at our input values. Let's, like, let's pick a, an x value. For this x value right here of 3, what are the corresponding y values? Well, those are the values that, that uh, match up with 3 on the graph. So if, this, if we look at this point, the x value is 3, and the y value is like, I don't know what that would be, like 2.8. So this point looks like 3, 2.8, or I'm sorry, 1.8. I'm just the math teacher, no biggie. Now, but if you notice, there's also another output value for 3, and it lies down here. And if I draw that over, I notice that I get 3, and maybe negative 1.8. So the problem with this one is that my input value of 3 is matched with two different y values. And that, again, is that idea of it being inconsistent uh, of 1 element in the domain, the input value, producing a couple of values in the range, or the output values. And it's also called the vertical line test. If you notice, if I sort of line these up, oops, that was no good. Over here, let's just kind of erase everything on the slide. We'll start over. If I take a vertical line and draw it in, you can see that that was a horrible vertical line. Well, you can see that it hits the graph twice, once here, once here. So that is basically telling me that this element in, in the domain, which is 4, is paired up with two output values. So the vertical line test means if you can draw a vertical line through the graph, and if it hits the graph more than once, it's not a function. So let's try another one. What about a graph that looks something like this? Okay, well again, take your vertical line and draw it at a bunch of different points on the graph if you think it's going to hit more than once. And you know what? No matter where I put this line, it's only hitting the graph one time. Okay? So that means that this one is a function because it passes the vertical line test. In other words, each one of these x values here, 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 and so on and so forth only have one output value. And that takes us to domain and range. Let's talk about domain and range a little bit more. Okay, let's find the domain of, of this function. Well, the domain is talking about all of the x values. Okay, and we just already kind of discussed x values and how that makes up the domain. What we want to do now is talk about are there any x values that make this particular function uh, undefined. Well, this one, no, but let me show you one that does. I'll skip to the next slide. This does have values of x that could make it undefined. Okay, and when would that be? Well, remember, one of the things that we want to look out for is when you have a denominator that's zero. Okay, for example, just a basic one. If you have five divided by zero, that is undefined. So what we're worried about here is I'm worried about this denominator ever being zero. Right? If I ever had x plus 4 divided by 0, depending on the x values, that would make the whole thing undefined. So it's, it's saying that the graph cannot exist at that location. Right? So we have to go back to that idea that we learned maybe a couple math classes ago, that if you divide anything by 0, that's undefined. Okay, So there's case 1. Dividing by 0 is undefined. Now here's case 2. Anytime that you take the square root of some negative number, just pick one, negative 6, you know that you're going to get uh, something in the answer that you don't want, right? This is going to send it straight to imaginary numbers, okay? And we don't want to have to deal with imaginaries because that takes the graph, shifts it off of the real plane into the imaginary plane. So what we want to stay away from is any time where we take the square root of a negative, okay? So there we have our two cases. We have denominator being 0 and square root of a negative. Knowing that, let's look at this first one. Does this match either one of those? Is the denominator ever going to be 0 here? And uh, the answer is no, because there's not even a denominator. 
So then is there a square root that we have to worry about? The answer to that is no as well. So what we say is that x can be any number. It's not ever going to produce undefined. So what we're going to do is we're going to say the domain d. We're going to draw this uh, funky bracket, squiggly bracket, x, right, the values of x, such that what happens? Well, x can be any number in the real number system. So we kind of write this, uh, this funny looking e, which just means is a member of, and then it's this r with like an extra line that is telling me that that is the notation for the real number system. Okay? So x can be any real number. Uh, all real numbers for x work. So that's how we write it, uh, math notation. So what about these? What about this one where we have the possibility of the denominator being zero? Well, let's find out when that is. If the denominator is equal to zero, it looks like this. Okay, so what would the values of x be that would make that zero? Well, if you notice, this is a quadratic, right? It's totally factorable, so we can do the diamond method. I need two numbers to multiply to get me negative three, two numbers to add to get me negative two. And what are those? Well, uh, it looks like negative three and then positive one would work, which means that when factored, you get x minus three times x plus one equals zero. And then using the zero product property, x minus 3 is 0, or x plus 1 is 0, which means that I get x is 3 or negative 1, okay? These are the values that are, they're bad, right? They're going to give me a 0 in the denominator. That's no good. So what does that mean? That means that my domain are all the values of x such that x cannot be equal to 3 or negative 1, right? It's saying you can pick any value for x except 3 or negative 1, and you're going to work. So notice that we had to do something a little different. We had to say x cannot be 3 or negative 1. That's a little bit easier than saying x can be everything else. Okay, so last one. We're going to talk about square root of a negative. Well, what does that mean? If a square root is negative, uh, then that will lead us to imaginary. So what do I want to say about about this number down here, this 3 minus 2x. Well, I want to say that this number cannot be negative. So how do I write that in math? Well, one of the things that we could do is we could say that this number has to stay positive or zero, right? Square root of zero is fine, and square root of all the positives is okay. So let's say that by saying that my number in here has to be bigger than zero or equal to zero. Okay, so now when I solve, what am I going to get? Take away 3. I get negative 2x greater than or equal to negative 3. And now we have to be careful about this next step. I want something with a little bit more contrast. And the, uh, green. So we're going to divide by negative 2, and we get x less than or equal to. I've got to change the direction of the equal sign because I divided by a negative. So x less than or equal to 3 over 2. Okay, so in order for me to stay away from negatives, in order for my, uh, my value underneath the square root to stay zero or positive, what I have to do is make sure that my x values are less than or equal to three over two. So if I were to write that, means the domain x, such that all the x values have to be less than or equal to three over two, okay? And that's it for domain, and we'll talk about range a little bit in the next section. Have a good one. We'll see you.